to. Good afternoon. It is Monday, October 25th. The Ag Market team is here to give our weekly discussion, and uh, we do have a special presenter uh, this week. And I'm going to bring Brian Split in since he's the one who brought this gentleman onto the meeting to kind of introduce you, give him a little bit of his background. Uh, so uh, why don't you introduce our guest speaker, Brian? Hey, thanks, Jim. So um, I had reached out to our guest. His name is Peter Meyer. And uh, he is the head of grain and oilseed analytics with S&P Global Platts. Uh, I've had the uh, opportunity to meet Peter a few times over the years. Uh, we were on a roundtable panel on U.S. Farm Report, a top producer years ago. And uh, just a, a guy I re really respect in the industry and his opinion on a lot of the goings on in, in the ag market. So uh, I had reached out to Peter to ask for some, uh, just some commentary on what he's hearing and what he's watching out for in the biofuel space. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Peter and, and let you do your thing. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I appreciate it, and I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, just to give you an idea, so maybe maybe 12, 18 months ago or so, the um, at S&P Global Platts, we don't we don't trade, so we're independent analysts. At about 12 or 18 months ago, I would say that most of our clients were banks and hedge funds and that sort of thing. Now they're all oil companies. And as a matter of fact, the, um, well, I shouldn't say all, but most of them are. As a matter of fact, we have one report we send out on a monthly basis called the Global Biofuels and Agriculture Outlook. And that is the most looked at report by our 1,200 clients globally. And uh, I, would, I would venture to guess that 12 months ago, they probably didn't really care. So that gives you an idea about what's going on here in the, in the biofuels business. Uh, I will say that what we're going to talk about today is renewable diesel. And there's a there's a distinction between renewable diesel bi and biodiesel, right? So biodiesel or ethanol for that matter are supplements to the fuel as, uh, as, as many of you know, right? So it's E10, E15, uh, biodiesel is B10. When we talk about renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel, those are drop-in fuels. That's a totally different ball game. So this is a matter of the biggest oil companies in the, in the country and in the world uh, trying to get their hands on on stock, on feedstock to use to uh, run through their refineries as a drop-in fuel to make renewable diesel. Why is renewable diesel or sustainable aviation fuel so hot? There's no national mandate really. Uh, it has to do with something called the LCFS, which is the low carbon fuel standard. This was implemented by West Coast states, California, um, Washington, uh, and then also New Mexico is involved, but there are other states throughout the Midwest that are looking at for it as well. Basically what it, what it does is it, it it, uh, it provides the producer with a, with a tax credit, and it's an enormous tax credit. In some of these, it's up to $2 a gallon. So it is, it is absolutely uh, well worth it for these, for these refining companies to, uh, to get into this business. And we've seen it, right? We've seen this deal with, with Marathon, Marathon with ADM. We've seen uh, Cargill get, get, it, get into a deal with Love's. Um, and we've, we've also uh, seen uh, just, just recently a big deal with Bungie where um, Chevron is going to give Bungie or give, invest $600 million in, their, uh, in a couple of their crush plants. Uh, Philip 66 has a deal with that new Shell Rock plant there in Iowa. All of these deals have right of first refusal on them. By that, I mean that all of these deals and these investments entitle the investor to 100% of the offtake of these plants regarding soil oil. Um, and products. Now, soy oil is not the only product that we that we uh, we make biodiesel. I'm sorry, we make renewable diesel from or sustainable aviation fuel. Sustainable aviation fuel can be made from ethanol. And as we just saw the news today, um, ADM is basically trying to get away from get get away from their uh, ethanol business. They sold a couple of plants last week to a private entity, and now this with today they have announced they're in. They're in a deal with a uh, with a sustainable aviation fuel company to produce 500 million gallons of sustainable aviation fuel a year. Uh, some of our clients include some of the biggest airlines in the world. They are pragmatic about it. They will agree that they need to reduce their carbon footprint, but they also understand that price. Let, let's just say this: in their opinion, price is is an object. It's not at any price. So they are a bit pragmatic about it. But the airlines that we talk to as well are looking at wood chips. They're looking at a hundred different things. So is soybean oil, are the, are the vegetable oils the main feedstock? No, they're not. What they want, what they really want is fats and tallows and use cooking oil. 
And when you look at what Europe is doing with rapeseed, or as we know it, canola here, the Canadian name, and, and yuco, use cooking oil. I mean, the, the EU is the largest importer of yuco from China. China is the largest exporter in the world. We export uh, used cooking oil as well, but it's, uh, it's controlled by a company called Nestle. That's Nestle without the L. And uh, all that, all that uh, used cooking oil goes to Singapore, and it actually comes back into the U.S. as fuel. Nestle is one of these other companies that have made big investments here in the U.S. They're a client of ours, and they are uh, bought uh, a tremendous uh, uh, tank farm down there at NOLA, where they're going to bring all, bring all the stuff back in. So when we look at it, we think that by 2025, you're probably going to need about 40 billion pounds of feedstock for all of these proposed renewable diesel sustainable aviation um, fuel plants. At the moment, you have six running, uh, maybe seven at the moment, but there's another 20 right behind them. And they have the biggest names behind them as well. And they're basically in the South, in the Southwest, and also on the, on, on the West Coast, with the exception of Marathon that has a big plant there in, um, in North Dakota. So 40 billion, we only produce 25 billion pounds of soy oil this year. How are you gonna get the 40 billion? Well. Fats and tallows are going to make up a big a big chunk of it. Um, fats and tallow production, though, unfortunately, like everything else, is kind of flat. If we look at the last five years, fats, tallows, uh, yellow grease, which includes yuco, that is yuco, we use cooking oil, is about 14 billion pounds. You can't take it all, but you will take some. You're going to have to take some, you're going to have to take some uh, some soybean oil for sure, uh, canola oil. Canola doesn't have a pathway into some of these, uh, an approved pathway yet, but that is coming. Um, so you're going to, you know, by our estimation, you'll probably see the possibility of canola being planted as a winter crop in, um, in Kansas and some of the wheat states if this thing takes off. And the reason for that is because you do have some of these soft seed processing plants out there west, in the west. The other thing that we're looking at with a, with a major client and talking to some farmers about is camelina. Camelina is a cover crop. Camelina is an oil seed. And um, I was just able to procure two truckloads of Camelina to go to a, go to a Texas refinery, and they're currently doing doing their work work on it as well, uh, running it through the refinery to see how that goes. And it, and I can tell you, it was an easy fight. Two truckloads of Camelina in the U.S. It actually came through through a Canadian uh, provider, but we see this as really um, a much bigger deal than ethanol was. Um, and the reason for that is I'll go back to my opening comments that it is a drop in fuel. It's not an additive. It's a, it's a pure fuel. Will we get to the point like we did in 2008? And I'm old enough to remember that. And 2012 with the food versus fuel debate, we may, but there's going to be some other issues that have to have to get us to that food versus fuel debate. Meal is going to have to become much, much, much more expensive. In our opinion, you know, um, the fact that meal is, is at a depressed price at the moment is probably not going to lead to a food versus fuel debate. But we also work with seed companies that are working very closely about increasing and enhancing the percentage of oil you get out of a, out of a bushel of uh, soybeans. When we talk to some of these seed guys, they think you can get probably about a 4% increase from the current 19% to maybe 23% oil out of a, out of a bushel of soybeans. Um, but it comes at a price. And is the farmer willing to, willing to pay that price? That's really that's really the question, and they also claim that that will not reduce your your um, your meal production. They do have the technology and the genetics to push that number much much higher on the oil content, but then again, you start ending up with a little bit less meal or, or a lot less meal at the end of the day, and that could be an issue in the in the food versus uh, versus fuel debate. So it's an exciting time for us. I mean, we think um, we think this has some legs. We think it starts to kick in probably in 2023. And the reason for that is that's probably around the time when all these enhancements and these increased and this increased crush capacity starts to kick in from these investments. So, um, you know, uh, so, but there's a lot, you know, I've, I've been in the business a long time and there's a lot of changes going on. I mean, just today, you know, you, I'm just looking at, I'm just <laughs> looking at, Tesla stock, which is which is thousand forty five dollars today, up one hundred and eleven dollars, um, which is what fourteen percent or something like that. It's over a trillion dollars, and the reason for Tesla's up so much is a uh, the Tesla Model Three was the biggest selling car in Europe for the month of September. Never happened that an EV was that big um, in Europe or, or led the led the field, so to speak. 
but also um, uh, Ford Motor Company made an announcement early this morning. They're going to purchase 100,000 Teslas, $4.2 billion, 100,000 Teslas. So in our opinion, the proliferation of EVs is something that you have to be aware of if you're bullish ethanol. We're not necessarily bullish ethanol, obviously. Um, we see that we see ethanol demand kind of tapering off, not not falling off a cliff, but kind of leveling out in 2025. And then from there, uh, leveling or moving down down further uh, on the scale. And that's based on the proliferation of EVs, as, we, as I just mentioned. But there's hope behind that. And that hope is that it's rather than use corn for ethanol. And look, you can use ethanol for sustainable aviation fuel. Let's, so let's not totally discount that. But there is going to be hope for uh, for the oil seeds, everything from cottonseed oil to to uh, soybean oil, canola oil, you name a veg oil, and they'll find a path for it. Uh, so I'm glad to. I hope that gave you gave you a good uh, basis there. Sorry if I went on a little bit. I'm glad to answer any questions. Peter, so um, it sounds like we're going to have uh, an increase in, in the use of, of soybean oil and the other vegetable oils. Um, and uh, while there's still some future uses for ethanol, and you'd mentioned the, uh, the sustainable aviation fuel, uh, due to the proliferation of, of electric vehicles, we're still going to see a, a demand loss. So does, it, does this future world look like a, a world where we then continue to plant uh, more acres of soybeans uh, because of, of vegetable oil demand uh, and less of corn, uh, I, but I, we I would, maintain uh, a, a, just a different price relationship then, or how does that look? Yeah, I, I believe that's the case. And, and I also, I mean, we've, I have a slide and I'm sorry, I don't have, have it with me here on this call, but we, we call this the domestication of U.S. soybean supply, right? We're going to if we can get the crush capacity up over 2.5 billion bushels, I mean, we estimate it currently around 2.35, maybe get it to 2.6. You're not going to have to worry about China, you know, uh, as far as a trade partner is concerned, in, in, in our opinion, because you'll be able to you'll be able to use most you'll be able to use most of it here. Um, you know, on the way Brazil is going, I mean, I I don't know where you guys stand on Brazil, but I'm probably in that 140 to 142 category just because million metric tons because I rather I'd rather start out the season walking, and I've seen that the attaché is already at 144. You know, that's up 7 billion from this year, uh, 7 million metric tons from this year, and Chinese import demand may be up one or two. So I think that this comes at, at the right time, Brian. Um, and I think that, you know, everybody says, oh, we saw it in ethanol, we saw it in ethanol. You just, you did not see this interest from the oil companies, if anything. I mean, farmers are used to fighting the oil companies for the last, whatever it's been, 13 years or 14 years, because uh, the oil companies, you know, basically fought them on every turn about whether we go to E12 or E15 or whatever. And now all of a sudden, you know, these oil companies want your product directly now. They don't want, they don't, they don't want the product from the ethanol they, or indirectly. They don't indirectly want your corn. They want it directly. So I think that that, you know, that sets the stage for possibly an increase in acres, as you suggest. Now, I've, I'm, I'm conservative by nature, and, and I always have been in, in our analysis, but I've already taken 3 million acres off of the corn number for next year. And I'm looking for numbers like around 17, 18, when we planted 90 and 90. But the reason for that is, and we talked about this previous to the call, is the price of fertilizer. So, you know, we do worry about the price of nitrogen-based fertilizer, our natural gas group. Um, really sees a tough winter here for uh for gas prices so and it really is more about supply in the spring i mean if 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 you're a farmer and you've been waiting six months for a tire or track for your for your tractor you're not probably feeling good about getting dry fertilizer in the spring right no matter what the price is so we do see a three million acre shift i do i do worry though that we might be a year early with the shift and the reason for that is as i mentioned earlier we don't see the um all this capex spending into into these crush plants taking hold until 2023. So we may end up with a glut uh, of uh, of soybeans here in 2022. But past that, Brian, and into 2025, I would imagine that uh, yeah, the table the table sort of sort of gets reset. Peter, this is Bill. Okay, and, 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 oh. oh, go ahead, Bill. I'll, I'll ask later. <clears throat> um, I got two questions. The the food for fuel argument. 
I mean, is that even uh, realistic when you're talking about most of this is being recycled from food oil spent out? And then the second question I have is, is the carbon credit of renewable fuels greater than the carbon credit associated with an electrical vehicle? And, and if so, doesn't that favor diesel run cars in the future? I'll take the second one first. So the, uh, the carbon credit is, 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 a little, is a little bit higher, but the issue there is that, you know, as a, if I was an oil refiner, oil refiners really don't refine for gasoline, right? Diesel is where they make their money. Because diesel, diesel is really where, where it's at, so to speak. And we don't, while we see the proliferation of EVs, we don't see the proliferation of ETs. We don't see trucks going out here. And that's really why they're, why they're out there. They, they know they're kind of losing the battle on the gasoline front, I, in, in our opinion. And they want to make sure that they're positioned correctly about the, um, uh, with, the, with the trucks. And that's really, and with sustainable aviation fuel. Sustainable aviation fuel, I mean, yeah, okay. United Airlines announced recently they bought 50 electric planes for short hops. I get it. But the fact of the matter is, is that they also announced they're bringing back supersonic transportation that's going to be uh, going to be entirely fueled by sustainable aviation fuel. I mean, you know, um, Southwest Airlines said they want to be at 10% by 2023. That's a big number. So, you know, I, I the the low carbon the low carbon fuel uh, credits the LC, the LCFS um, it is it is a little bit higher for diesel, and some people think that it'll that it'll come down a little bit. But the fact that but the fact of the matter, Bill, is that as far as the airlines are concerned, this is really a little uh, less about the the credit and more about reducing their carbon footprint. Um, on the food versus fuel thing, no, we're going to use um, you know we're not going to use recycled soybean oil and a lot of yeah you'll use UCO uh, use cooking oil and that sort of stuff, but. But I mean, the USDA has this, or the EIA has this, I think at about 10 or 11 billion pounds of pure soybean oil this year. I think they're at 11, I'm at 12. And like I said, we see that number possibly getting as high as 25, um, if that's even, even possible. It's probably not, but, I, but we think it's going to 25 by the year 2030 or 2040. And that would, that would, that would really um, be a lot of, uh, a lot of increased, increased uh, crush capacity. And, you know, I mean, we're probably a little bit too high of that. I should, I should really say that's probably more, more veg oil uh, rather than, because we, we do expect an increase in canola oil production, uh, both out of Canada and the U.S. and Canada. We've seen those farmers move away from canola recently in, in favor of pulse crops, uh, peas, lentils, that sort of stuff. We see them going back to canola. And when you talk to the um, seed companies, like I mentioned earlier, they see canola going into uh, going into some of these, uh, some of these states like Kansas to plant winter wheat. So yeah, you know, the food versus fuel, fuel debate is always tough. We, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are many on this call that were around, like I said, back in 08, when it started back in 12, when we had the terrible drought here in the US. Um, it's just, it's just one of those things where, oh, I don't know, when you, when you talk to an airline like United, they'll tell you they don't want it, they, they're aware of it, and they just don't want to be part of it. So that's why they're a little bit more pragmatic about everything. I don't know if that answers your question, Bill, or not. Peter, I think you opened up a question that I would then maybe look further into is you had kind of mentioned, hey, maybe in hard red wheat growing areas, we're going to see a, a little displacement of acres. So what acreage or what products uh, and other crops do you think would sacrifice uh, production acres to then meet this extra demand because I think when uh, Dan Bozzi was and uh, what was it the grain com in Geneva is that what it's called but um, he had suggested that you know over the next several years we're going to have to eventually see an, an additional 40 million acres of, of soybean uh, production to meet the the demand uh, that the current administration has for this this green agenda um, and that it has to be soybeans that are produced domestically. Uh, what's your feeling about that overall scenario and then what crops are going to sacrifice because of that? I don't see how we can, I, I don't, with all due respect to Dan, I don't, 40 million acres is an awful, an awful big number. But if I looked at it, I would look at your, win, you know, as far as, as far as what uh, acres could be sacrificed, so to speak, for this, it has to be looking at your winter wheat 
predominantly in Kansas. I mean, you can grow canola as a winter crop. But um, as far as camelina is concerned, you know, excuse me, that's a that's a uh, that's a winter crop as well. That's a cover crop. Now, the problem with camelina is that, um, you know, you could have and, and I do talk to uh, farmer friends of mine that are very willing uh, and interested in planting camelina as a cover crop next year in the fall of 2022. The problem is, is you need these soft seed processing plants and they're mostly out west. So if I talk to, uh, you know, a farmer in Iowa, the problem is, is, yeah, I'll grow it. I'll grow it for your for your client, Pete. But how, how are we going to get it all the way to the plant? So that's really the issue. So so you have two things there, Brian. You have the possibility of, of crops like camelina. Um, being grown as a cover crop in the winter, and then obviously that has to be harvested. And it also brings up the whole issue about, you know, ins crop insurance and and what it's going to cost to plant your fertilizer, blah 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 blah. But as far as acres concerned, I mean, I, I would think that your winter wheat acres would probably be a little bit susceptible here, should this should this thing take off, and if those farmers start to go to uh, go to plant canola instead. So maybe the food for fuel argument is more of a, not a direct result, but hey, we're, we're now sacrificing potential food production acres for acreage to, to sustain our, our biofuel. Yeah, we uh, don't see, but. we don't really see the food versus fuel, the thing, thing kicking in here. I mean, if the seed companies are right and they can increase the oil content of a bushel of of beans by by four percent from 19 to say 23 percent, without any loss, without suffering any loss in their meal production, there's not going to be any any sort of discussion there, right? I mean, the food versus fuel yeah, debate, yeah. the food versus fuel debate makes for great headlines, and we understand that. Uh, but you know, initially, like I like I said in my opening comments, I mean, unless they really push the genetics envelope. And start to push the uh, the oil content of a, of a bushel of soybeans from the current 19% to let they claim that that it's possible to get it to almost 40%. But then you would you would really start to lose a lot of your uh, a lot of your meal production. The other thing we have to remember about this, Brian, is that this 4% increase that I keep talking about is supposedly available off the shelf, but it's very expensive for farmers to to put that in. So unless you're farming right next to Shell Rock and Shell Rock. Uh, uh, runs a year and Shell Rock says, yeah, okay, we're going to pay, we're going to pay a, a premium for, let's say, a bushel that comes over our scales that has over 20% oil content. You're probably not going to pay that as a farmer, but, um, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, that's an issue as well. But the other thing is that for them to really be able to um, make a substantive change in the oil content from what we have, from what we know from the, uh, from the seed companies, it would take roughly seven years to go from lab to field. So that's gonna take a long time. And really what, what really has to happen there, Brian, from what, from all indications is that the price of oil needs to be four times the price of meal on a pound per pound basis, which is not even close to um, at the moment before these changes start to take place. But I know that there are some discussions among the, amongst the major seed companies regarding this renewable diesel or renewable fuel uh, revolution and how they can best uh, position themselves for it. Gotcha. Thank you for that answer. Sure. Hey Pete, since uh, you know you obviously uh, we'll have a lot of discussions, I'm sure around fertilizer due to energy prices. I'm just kind of wondering what you know with natural gas doing what it's done here lately, especially today. Uh, what's your thought process uh, on two different scenarios? Just a normal fall, which I don't know that we're going to see, but then a, a scenario where we don't get a lot of anhydrous put on this fall. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, what, what do you think the impact it would be on your 90 million acre forecast for corn? Do you think that we can achieve that if we can't get anhydrous applied this fall to a, to a large degree? Well, Matt, you and I know each other for a long time. And like I said earlier, for those that don't know me, I'm, I'm pretty conservative. So that 3 million acre shift was, was just based on conservative converse, or conversations I've had with farmers that have, you know, been able to procure enough, enough, um, uh, fertilizer in the spring to cover that amount, you know, uh, let's let's say rather than half of their acres, maybe a third of their acres or something like that. I mean, you know, a lot of these guys held their nose back in July and bought some stuff, but didn't buy it all because it was so expensive. And now after Ida and everything else, the thing has exploded. So I'm, 
I'm very conservative, and that's why, and 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 because there there is this precedent for uh, 90 and 90, so to speak, um, back in 17, 18. You know, that's that's kind of where kind of where we are. We were. I did face some pressure from clients about what do you think? What do you think with the fertilizer prices? So you know, yeah. But uh, regarding the price of natural gas and and, and nitrogen. Um, we think, and this should not be a surprise to anybody, it's going to be a cold winter, um, and I don't mean weather-wise, it's just going to be a cold winter in Europe. Europe really has the problems, you know, and then we also have Russia now talking about not, not exporting as much fertilizer, keeping Putin has said he's going to keep enough to keep his farmers happy. Um, China, obviously, uh, from every indication, given their electricity issues and, and them shutting down the mines, we don't expect any phosphate exports from them until June, June of next year, which is going to put a damper on things. So, you know, I mean, look, when we look at the world, China and Russia under, uh, understand food security. Do we in the West understand food security? Probably not. You know, yeah, we're going to complain about the price of meat. We're going to complain about the price of this. We're going to complain about the price of that, given the current environment with inflation. But the fact of the matter is it's not a, it's not really a security issue for us. But I think that when you look at Russia, the way they cut their wheat exports, the way that now they're going to they're going to cut back on their on their um, mineral exports that are used for fertilizer. China with the same thing in the back of their mind, they're also trying to keep their uh, their constituency, for lack of a better term, happy by uh, by by food security. So um, I don't really know if it's a price thing, Matt, as much as I believe that. With, all, with these countries cutting back on exports and everything else that's going on in the supply chain and what's happened uh, and with Ida um, at NOAA, I mean, I would, I would think it's more about, a, it's more about not, what, not what does it cost, but can I get it? And we've heard that from, from, uh, from many of our farmer contacts as well, where even stuff like, like glyphosate, nobody's, made, nobody's given you a price on, on glyphosate because, and they will, only when it hits the floor because they don't know. Now I know Bayer has said that they're ready and they're they're ready to go and they can get NOLA back up and going. So that's fine. But I mean, really every, you know, the US farmers getting it from all angles at this point, they they really were were sitting on high price fertilizer in the spring as the fertilizer business wanted to take advantage of these high prices. Now you have propane costs that are what double, some places even higher, and, and glyphosate costs that are 200 to 300 percent higher. So yeah, I, you know, the glyphosate thing is something that worries us, obviously, because we have to make yield adjustments for next year. But as far as the acreage is concerned, uh, that's just a conservative first step for us, Matt, and we're just going to kind of see how it goes. Yeah, appreciate it. Hey, hey, Pete, this is Jim. Do you okay. have any thoughts on fertilizer, like in South America, Brazil, they're, you know, Safrina corn crop, are they going to have shortages down there, like, you know, fear and like you have around here, or you heard any? What have you heard for South America production and fertilizer and shortages? Yeah, we've heard we've heard kind of we've heard the same thing. You know, we've we've heard that there that there is some some concern on the second crop. There is there is some fertilizer down there, but uh, whether whether that's enough or not, you know, who knows? It's 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 the same thing. You know, when we look at like uh, like these Kansas City prices or Minneapolis prices for wheat, everybody saw. Oh, I'm going to see it tremendous shift. Yeah, you're going to see a shift, but what's that going to cost you, right? Because it's really back to the availability. So Jim, I would say that what we've, what we've seen is, is on a global basis, when we talk to farmers from Ukraine to, to Russia to, to, to Brazil as well, they are all, this is all the same fear that they have that the U.S. farmer has. But as you suggest, uh, farmers in the Southern Hemisphere, this is much more, um, Shall we say they're running out of time, so to speak? While the U.S. farmer can hope for the best and hope that it, you know, the supply chain cleans up in the cleans up by the spring. But uh, boy, unfortunately, we have our doubts about that. Well, thanks for that, uh, Pete. Any other questions for Pete? While we have them, guys. I don't bite. Yeah, <laughs> no. Any other last questions? You got anything for him, Bill? Before we wrap, uh, before we bring on, uh, talk about the cattle with Ross. Well, I would like to know where soybean oil is going to be a month from now. That'd be awesome. Well, uh, I can. Let me say this. I, you know, we've we've seen we've obviously seen the curve. 
you know, the curve kind of got flat around 55 cents. And then all of a sudden, then we saw the curve kind of jump up here where we are now, where we where we've seen the severe backwardation. Some of that, I think, uh, you know, has to do with or initially had to do with the speculators. I don't know where the price is going to be, but I can tell you that there. Let me let me just put it this way. We have told our clients that 55 cents between 50 and 55 cents represents a value area for them. So I would say that that, you know, the, the chances of us kind of trading below that level, in, in our opinion, in my opinion, are probably are probably pretty low. And our clients would agree. Our clients are are eager buyers around 55 and they and the you know the back of the curve is pretty close there. They are starting to look at it, but they've backed away from the front. And we saw that with CVR um, out in Kansas, which last month said that uh, they were going to put the, their plans on hold a little bit. That's a, um, uh, is that Carl Icahn or Boone Pickens? I don't, I don't remember which one, but they, they said that they were uh, stepping away due to the high cost of, of feed stocks. But the fact of the matter is that when they made that announcement, the feed stock prices weren't that high. I think what they're trying to do there is they're trying to play the fats and tallows card because the fats and tallows, Valero has a deal with Darling. Darling is the largest renderer in the U.S. And, and you don't really see how much of the fats and tallows are moving to Valero from, um, uh, from Darling. Valero, by the way, has said that we're, we have a shortage of, of used cooking oil in this country as well. Yeah, shocker that is. But anyway, um, so I, I think what the, what CVR is saying is that, you know, they ex, what they said basically on their call, I listened to them on the call, they expect some of these principal to principal contracts to be broken. What we have seen, though, is that all the transparency in these prices that is available and it is limited due to these principal to principal contracts, we've seen fats and tallows and all these feedstocks kind of migrate to the soybean oil price but not in the front end towards the back end in that 55 to 60, 60 cent kind of range. And we, and I stand by, we stand by what we, what we've told our clients for the last six months that we expect that to be a, a value range for them, meaning they better grab some if they want it. So I don't know where it's going to be in a month, but I can tell you that we see plenty of support about eight cents lower from here. Okay. Hey Pete, I got one other question. You talked about earlier and you're about the group and the who's, buying your research now with the hype of inflation and the talk inflation just in the forefront it seems like every business show every political you show you watch are you seeing a hint of more just investors pure raw speculator money coming into the commodity markets again i know we seem like we heard a lot of that earlier this year kind of waned again but are, are you hearing just pure or seeing interest and in just pure speculators saying hey i want to own commodities in general no, not well. I can only I can only specifically say because specifically talk about the about the ag side. They were very hyped up about it in the spring, and they made a lot of money, and and they kind of got out. So our investment clients are are mostly kind of sitting on the sidelines now, kind of watching what's going on. I can't. I, I'm sorry, but I can't really speak to what they're doing um, on the on the on the oil side of the business. I mean, but they are they definitely are paying attention. Um, we definitely had some speculative interest from our clients, um, from our investor clients on the oil side and a little bit on the soybean side. The corn market, they're kind of staying away from at the moment. But um, I mean, we, look, those clients are still clients of ours, but they've been they've been rel relatively quiet. I think after they saw the big run up and then the and then the run back, run back down, they said, yeah, we've seen this movie before. So if there's anything that our clients are are interested in, the our investment clients uh, it would be on the it would be on the bean oil side. Peter, this is Bill again. Does is the investment money looking more at the heating oil to bean oil spread more than what they used to? I mean, I don't, than the industry would look at a crush spread. Is that how we're is that how we're coming up with economic value today? Uh, there is there is uh, some some look some are looking at that, but they don't particularly just focus on that specifically given the LCFS credit, right? The LCFS credit really throws a wrench into the whole thing, you know, and I, and I know that there are colleagues and colleagues at other, I'll call them colleagues, colleagues at other firms that are suggesting that this, you know, uh, that there is this, this inherent relationship between the two. I'm not saying that there isn't, but the pro, but the thing is, is that the, it, it's not as, as simple as it used to be given these LCFS credits of, of as high as $2 a gallon, 
which really kind of, you know, screw up the economics. If that makes, does that make sense to you, Bill? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. It does. Thank that, you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really, that's really what we, what we see. I mean, you know, I, I look, I, you know, we're, our, our purchase or our merger with IHS market is, has just been approved. So that's going to happen at the end of November. And, and we have, we have very different views sometimes uh, for the Platts analytics team versus what the, what the old Informa guys are saying. And I know that they're, they're very keen on the, on the relationship between heating oil and crude oil and, and the price of bean oil. But like I said, when we talk to our, our refinery clients, they're, you know, they're massive spreadsheets that they use. I mean, it, it, it really, yeah, do they pay attention to it a little bit? But like I said, that it's, it's really all these tax credits that really make up, make up a big difference and make up the bulk of what they're looking at. Did I answer your question, Bill? Yes, it did. Thanks, guys. I'm done. All righty. Are there any other are there any other questions? Okay, Peter. I think that answered all the questions from the group. I think we're going to jump on to the cattle comment questions, real cattle feed. If you want to stay with yeah. us, or if you uh, need to jump on and move on to the other stuff, uh, we uh, really appreciate your time. I appreciate it as well. And and it's either there were no questions or I put everybody to sleep. So it was either one or the other, Jim. So I'll, I'll stay on and listen to your cattle no. feed comments if you don't mind. All right. Sounds good. Hey, Ross, um, you, you are up. We definitely had a cat. We had the cattle on feed report on Friday and, uh, you know, looked a little bit positive to me, but um, what did numbers tell you? what did they say? What did they tell you? What are you thinking or, you know, for the cattle market here in the next couple of weeks and months? Yeah, Jim. So we went into Friday, you know, into the close. I, you know, the trade was leaning more towards, uh, you know, bearish cattle on feed report with placements being the, the bearish estimate. Guesses were 101.4 of a year ago. And if anyone recalls last year, uh, we did have very big placements on the cattle on feed report as well. So the 101.4 was going into the report going to be negative in, in terms of, you know, year ago numbers. Um, obviously, that number came in well below that. So the on feed was 98.6 versus guesses of 99.3 was the estimate. Um, that, that's a bullish number. Um, placements were 97.1 versus 101.4 was the estimate. That is a bullish number. And the, the marketings came in just a, a little bit below the estimates, but I would call it neutral. Um, I mean, it's just very in line. 96.9 was the actual versus 97.3 was the estimate. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was no doubt a bullish report versus what the trade guesses were, especially with the risk off that we saw on Friday, uh, live cattle were down uh, a little over a dollar and feeders were down two to two and a half bucks going into, into Friday's close. Um, if you d dive into the numbers a little bit, the on feed number, um, this does make the, the fourth straight cattle on feed report where on feed is below a hundred. Um, that is, that is friendly for the cattle market. I know, uh, you know, we've struggled in the cattle market and it seems like we can't get cash going this and that, but th this will definitely come into play down the road. Um, that the on feed, um, the actual number was around 85,000 head less than what the estimates were. Um, placements, obviously this was the big driver that I would say caught the trade off guard. Um, the, the placements number, the actual was 90,000 head less than what the estimates were. So, I mean, it, it was a very friendly number. And then marketings came in, I mean, it was 7,000 head less than the estimate. Obviously, we would love to see marketings a little bit more, but, you know, it, it was a neutral number. Um, the, we also did after, uh, right at the same time, we had the cold storage report that came out. And I would say that was, that was friendly for proteins. Again, total red meat supplies and freezers, they were up 4% from last month, but down 4% from a year ago. Um, to break the, those numbers down just a little bit, the total pounds of beef and freezers, that was up 5% from last month, but that's down 6% from a year ago. Frozen pork supplies, that's up 3% from a month ago. Uh, uh, yeah, up 3% from last month, and then that was a little bit above a year ago. Um, stocks of pork bellies, they were down 26% from last month and down 48% from last year. So, I mean, just, just the, you know, we, we've seen 
fantastic demand domestically and globally. Um, and I don't see that changing. We did have, you know, exports were disappointing here last Thursday on the beef front of it. Um, but, you know, the reality is China continues to be a very active buyers of US beef. They do still have this, uh, this dispute going on with Brazil to where they're still not taking Brazilian beef. Um, definitely something, you know, to keep watching. Um, the one other thing I, I would hit on, um, we did have the commitment of traders report come out last Friday. We did see that the, the funds are, you know, starting to step back into adding some link to the live cattle side. Um, it, it's not a very big long, it's a little over 40,000 contracts of length. We did see them trim their feeder cattle short um, a little bit, but they are still short feeders. I mean, it was only a, uh, about 220 contracts of feeder cattle shorts. Maybe with Friday's sell off, you know, they might be short a little, um, but they're definitely getting out of that short. And my bias is I don't see them going back to building that short um, in feeder cattle. And then I guess the last thing I will hit on, we did have, you know, cash cattle was uh, pretty quiet last week. It, it was up about 50 cents week over week, but the one really uh, uh, positive note last week was we did have a very big slaughter number, uh, 661,000 head is what we ended up killing for the week. And estimates this week, I think are around 660 again. It would be fantastic to see another big slaughter like that. And that's about all I got, Jim. Okay, any questions for Ross on the cattle side of the equation? All right, one thing before we wrap it up. Um, real quick, rainfall, guys. We got a ton where we're at here in northern Illinois. Henry got, County got about an inch and a half of rain. You go south of me down toward Bloomington, it got anywhere from one to four inch rain total, as my customer is telling us. Right now, the average trade guest is looking for harvest activity around corn, 65% complete. Bean activity, harvest activity for tonight, we're looking at it around 74% complete compared to 60% last week. So we did make a little bit of progress. Is anybody make any comments? I know we talked a little bit, Matt, before we started recording about quality issues and what you're hearing uh, specifically. Can you make kind of a comment on the bean harvest? Anybody else want to join in after that? Please do. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt uh, that uh, soybean harvest, people tried to harvest as much as they could this past week coming up on a big storm system. Uh, a lot of high moisture beans were harvested, uh, certainly uh, not ideal for a producer given the moisture and shrink docks that you have to go through, but at the same time it beats leaving them out in the field. A lot of beans are shattering, uh, certainly having field loss, and so last week Illinois was at 50% harvested on soybeans. Be very interesting to see just how much got done this past week because I don't think there was a ton uh, that was able to be completed because a lot of folks were still trying to get some of the corn out of the field, but regardless, uh, the remaining beans that are going to be in the field are certainly going to take a yield hit. I don't know how much it remains to be seen, but uh, unfortunately, if you get too much farther along in here, we don't dry out this time of year. Uh, you're you're going to need probably 10 days of dry weather for some people to be able to get on some of these fields that had two to four inches of rain. And there's a pretty significant chunk between uh, Jim, where you live and where I live, uh, of folks that got that kind of rain. So uh, it's pretty concerning in my part of the world. There's a lot of beans still out in the field. We did get finished up on Friday, very fortunate there, but uh, there was a lot of beans that just simply haven't been able to be harvested yet, and I do expect it to be reflected. Now, with that being said, in fairness, I thought this was a record soybean crop. I still felt like the USDA was a little low on yield, but at this stage of the game, we might trim that back. As far as what I was uh, uh, considering, a uh, 52 bushel or better crop, you know, I'm going to have to probably back off that just a shade because of how many beans are certainly on the field still. Any thoughts on your yield adjustment map from what you're saying? I, I, I think, you know, maybe maybe I would just stay status quo with what the USDA said this last month. I mean, I'm not sure I'd want to go up another half bushel at this stage of the game. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think when it's all said and done, you're going to find that a lot of the soybeans that were already harvested were phenomenal yields. Uh, heard record uh, yields from uh, uh, just a vast majority of producers. You know, but the problem is some of these beans that are, are left to be harvested, there's no telling what they'll end up making. So I think uh, my personal opinion would be uh, to make no adjustment. Uh, maybe we will slide, uh, but I, I certainly want to see what the USDA has to say about it in, in November. Okay. Well, guys, any other comments before we wrap it up for the day? All right. Well, let's wrap it up. I again want to thank Peter Meyer for joining us. Pete, thank you again for your thoughts. Um, we appreciate your time. Um, with that, we will wrap up today's discussion and we will be back on 
Wednesday with our technical analysis. Have a good week of trading. Thank you, guys.